Welcome to Silverburn Flax Mill. The story of the flax mill starts in 1854 when Arthur Russell leased the 32 acres of the estate from the Jury Estate, the largest landowners in the area. We've often wondered why it was they decided to come here to build the flax mill and why at that particular point. To explain that, we need to talk about what flax is and what it's used for and how it's processed. So, flax is a straw plant and it's used primarily in the 19th century to make linen. Um, there are six stages before you get to the finished linen product. First of all, there's de-seeding of the flax itself. Then there's what's called retting, which involves putting the flax straw in water for a number of days, which rots the fibres you want to process away from the central core of the plant, making it easier to separate. And the final stage of flax processing is called scutching, where the dried fibres are then broken, the straw from the outside removed, leaving you with the long fibres that you want to then turn into linen. To turn those fibres into linen, you then need to spin them, to weave them, and to finish them to produce white linen. But in the uh, mid-19th century, the majority of the flax that was used to make linen in Scotland arrived already scutched from Russia and the Baltic states. But in 1853, the Crimean War broke out and we did much as we've done recently with Russia, we stopped all of those imports. So the Russells, we believe, identified a commercial opportunity. And that was based on the availability of three key technologies. First of all, a steam engine to power all of the machinery within the mill. Secondly, the availability of the railway. The East Fife rail line ran through the golf course, which is just behind the flax mill, and they knew that they could get a siding in here so they could move flax and coal to power the steam engine in bulk using rail wagons, and they could move the finished products out in bulk, therefore achieving economies of scale. And the last key technology was something called the Schenck process. Robert B. Schenck was an American who was interested in how you could improve flax processing. And he came up with his process, which involved doing the first three stages, that's de-seeding, retting, and scutching all in one building, whereas typically they had been done in small batches and moved between those processes by horse and cart. So that led the Russells to build a flax mill here in order to process flax on an industrial scale. The building started in 1856 and the building was finished in 1857. We know from the records that the flax mill operated for 15 years. It then closed for a period of 15 years, and then reopened for two years and then finally closed in 1889 as a flax mill. Why was that? We don't really know. There's more research to do on that but we can take a few guesses. First of all, flax was an unpopular crop with farmers. They made more money, more profit out of growing cereals than they did out of flax, which is a notoriously difficult crop. Secondly, there's the availability of cheaper cotton clothing with imports from the empire. And finally, the resumption, of course, of imports of uh, already scutched flax from Russia and the Baltic states when the Crimean War ended. So, the flax mill closed by 1889, but why is this building here? Well, in 1867, we know that there were nine flax or linen mills in the Leven district employing over 3,000 people. But as far as we can find out, this is the only physical evidence of that industrial heritage that remains. We know that there were only four Schenck retories, as they were called, built in Scotland. One at Thornton, one at Oyne in Aberdeenshire, and one at Pulteney Town in Wick. And again, as far as we can find out, this is the only survivor. That makes it a very historic building. But why did this one survive when others didn't? And the reason for that is because the Russells changed the focus of Silverburn Park Estate. So it was used as a laundry, it was used as offices for the estate, and it was used as accommodation. In the First World War, it was requisitioned by the War Office and used for stabling for horses. And in the Second World War, it was home to 120 paratroopers from the 1st Polish Parachute Brigade. The Russells' emphasis in Silverburn changed from industrial to natural heritage. Like many wealthy Victorian families, they planted trees from seeds that they had gathered touring around Europe on the Grand Tour, and they turned the estate into their family home. But unlike many wealthy Victorians, they didn't exclude the local public from the park. 
They allowed the locals to come into the park, to go down to the beach to swim, and they allowed the boys brigade and the scouts to come in and camp in the park. So they're a very philanthropic family. They've got close connections with St Andrews University, where the Russell family archive is kept. And they have close connection with Iona, where they helped to set up their Iona Foundation, and they still have a holiday home there. But eventually, the family decided that they no longer needed the estate, and in 1974, they gifted it to Leven Town Council. But that gift is governed by a conservation agreement with the National Trust for Scotland, which says that the park has to be kept forever as a place of quiet relaxation, nature trails and organised camping for the benefit of the public in general and the people of Leven in particular. So, Leven Town Council was then subsumed by Kirkcaldy District Council and in the early 80s Kirkcaldy District Council set up an animal farm and a petting zoo based around the flax mill and also an exhibition of agricultural equipment. That ran very successfully as a tourist destination with approximately 25 to 30,000 visitors a year. Kirkcaldy District Council was then subsumed by uh, Fife Council and in 2002 Fife Council closed down their animal facilities across all their parks, not just Silverburn Park. And then the park went into decline due to a shortage of resources to maintain it. And eventually in 2011 the council started a process to look for a partner organisation to take over the management and regeneration of Silverburn Park. In 2012 they chose Fife Employment Access Trust as their preferred bidder. FEET, as it's known, is a mental health charity which works with people with a, a variety of mental health conditions to give them the training and support they need to self-manage their condition and to get back into productive employment and has been very successful in doing that. So FEET saw a Silverburn Park as a platform they could use to help people with their mental health and general well-being. FEET then set about doing a community consultation and that very extensive consultation produced a list of 65 different things that local people wanted to see in the park. In terms of feasibility, what we were looking for were facilities we could install in the park that would generate sufficient income to meet the running costs of the park and therefore ensure that the park was available for all future generations. And eventually, in 2014, the first business plan was produced and then approved by the local area committee. That business plan has a strap line, which is heart, mind and soul. Heart is about the affection lots of local people, now adults, have for the park, having come here with their parents and grandparents to visit the animal farm and the petting zoo. The younger generation have lost that connection because during their lifetime the park has been abandoned, overgrown and neglected. We want to remake those connections to make them understand that it's their park as much as anybody else's and to get them involved in looking after it for future generations. The mind bit is about the well-documented benefits of working outdoors for people with mental health conditions. The availability of Silverburn Park fits neatly into the core principles of the charity. Just to give you an example, we run a programme called Grow Your Mind with veterans in the park. As a veteran myself, I spoke to the first group that came through here and it was clear talking to them, they didn't really understand what the park could do for them. By the time they'd gone through their program, they actually asked if they could take over part of our vegetable allotment here. And the four of them still come in every week to tend the vegetables and to meet up and socialize. That just demonstrates how working outdoors can help people with mental health conditions. And finally, the sole bit is about bringing the park back to life, turning it back into a park that belongs to the community, that works for the community, and that we can all be proud of again. And that business plan has two phases. The first phase in the short term was to open a cafe and a campsite, and we've done that. The Cottage Window Cafe is now operating very successfully as a takeaway from number three cottage, and the campsite opened in September 2020 and has four camper van pitches, three pods, a toilet and shower block, and 12 tent pitches. Just to give you an example of how successful that's been, in July and August last year, the overall occupancy rate for the campsite was 91%. The longer term phase was this building, the flax mill, which will be the main income generator. So what we'll do now is take you around the building and show you what's here and what we plan to do with it. So this part of the flax mill was used for de-seeding and is one of the only two parts of the mill that has a first floor. 
And this rather neatly demonstrates the decisions that you have to take when dealing with a historic building. Do you restore the building back to how it was originally built or do you renovate what's there? And in this case, we're going to open this space up and use it as a meeting and event space. This will allow us to hold meetings, training events, but also art exhibitions, film shows and potentially weddings in here. The walls behind me here are not original. They were installed when the building was modified after it closed as a flax mill. So in this area of the building, what we're going to do is remove those walls and open this right up to the far end of the gable wall. And this will allow us to have a usable, flexible space. And also at the far end, we will have our own reception area and shop. And that shop will not be selling your usual tartan tat made in China. We are growing our own flax here. We will then be processing it as part of the wider activity program that runs alongside the construction of the flax mill. And that will produce um, long fibres which will then be taken off site, spun, woven and turned into linen products that we will sell in our shop unique to us. There are a couple of other features in here that are of interest. Uh, there's two brackets uh, up here which are part of the system that was used to transmit power throughout the building from the steam engine and we'll see in a minute where the steam engine was. That was a system of rods and gears that allowed the power to be transmitted from the flywheel on the steam engine throughout the building to power all the machinery. And the first floor space above us is going to be used for offices for Feet Trading Community Interest Company, which is the management company for the park, and for other partner organisations. And that will provide us with a flexible hot working space, offices, um, staff rest facilities, and also server and communication facilities. The area behind me is going to be the main entrance to the building. Again, the wall behind me is not original. That's going to be removed, opening the entrance up to the gable wall. And this entrance then leads into the circulation corridor for the building. And that corridor is going to be a key part of the interpretation plan. That interpretation plan is designed to allow the building to tell its own story. And it has a number of themes. First of all, what is flax? How is it used? And how did this flax mill fit into the wider flax industry across Fife and Scotland? Secondly, the story of the project itself, how we saved the building and how we turned it into the visitor centre and community hub that it's going to be. Then a bit about shared words. There are a lot of words that are unique to the flax and linen industry, like hecklers, millies. We'll be talking about all of that, uh, but also Gaelic. Um, we are the first Gaelic friendly public park in Fife and about 300 years ago virtually everybody in Fife spoke Gaelic. So we're very keen to tell that story as part of the flax mill as well, but also Polish. As I mentioned earlier, 120 Polish paratroopers lived in here before they moved south in 1944 to drop into Arnhem. And we want to tell their story because there are now second, third, fourth generation Polish Scots families. And that interpretation plan will then run down this corridor and throughout the building on the floors, on the walls, on the tables in the cafe and in the toilets. This part of the building is probably the most historically significant part of the building. This is where the retting vats were and we believe there were 12 timber frame retting vats in this area. So I'm actually standing in what would have been a retting vat. The wall um, to my side here is not original. That was open to the atmosphere and there were just the cast iron columns supporting the roof. Why was it open? Well, because retting produces quite a noxious smell, so that allowed the fumes to escape, but it also allowed them to move the flax in and out of the building easily through that wall. So this part of the building we're going to turn into our cafe and restaurant. It'll be an 80-seater cafe and restaurant with outdoor seating area as well. In order to do that, we're going to raise the floor level up to the same level throughout, with the exception of two retting vats, which will be behind us, which you'll actually be able to sit in. That will display the tanking that's around the outside of the walls and will allow people to get the experience of actually sitting in a retting vat whilst they're drinking their coffee. The servery will be inside the building and we are building the only area of new build outside which will have the kitchen, the storage facilities, wash up, etc. actually outside the building in a new timber framed extension. And that wall I mentioned will have just the columns and outside it will be a glass wall so you get the impression of what it was like when there was no uh, corrugated iron wall there. At the far end behind me, uh, we're going to open up the arches, put in glass and there'll be a door in the centre where the current plywood panel is. 
which allows you to access the outside for the seating area for the cafe and restaurant. And over to this side, there'll also be glass doors that allow you to see into and if the artists are amenable, access the arts and crafts studios that we'll have a look at in a minute. The roof above me is currently glass reinforced plastic. We now know that the original roof was pan tiles. We are not going to go back to pan tile roofs because the roof beams are compromised and pan tiles are very heavy. There's quite a high maintenance cost. So what we're doing is replacing the glass reinforced plastic roof with a modern aluminium uh, corrugated roof which has insulation built in. One of our key aims is to make the building as energy efficient as possible which is sometimes difficult with a single thickness Victorian brick building. But we will be heating the whole building with a ground source heat pump and using heat recovery from air systems throughout the building. When we first started this project, we had no idea that the building had a tall brick chimney in the centre of the building. And it was only when somebody sent us a postcard from 1903, taken from Leven Links, which showed David Russell's flax mill with a tall chimney, that we realised that this here is the bottom of that chimney. Now, we're not going to rebuild that brick chimney because it would be very expensive to do. And every year we would have to get somebody like Fred Dibner to climb up it in order to inspect it. So we will uh, renovate what is here and we will use technology to represent what the building looked like with a tall chimney. This part of the building is where the steam engine was situated and to my left is the stone plinth that it sat on. Unfortunately we don't have the machinery uh, when it closed as a flax mill in 1889 that was all sold off. On top of the stone plinth you've got the bolts where it was bolted down, you've got pipe work and you've also got elements of the rod and gear system that was used to power the rest of the machinery throughout the building. This area we're going to use as an access corridor so people will come through here to get to the public toilets. Um, passing this and we will obviously use this as part of the interpretation display with a model of a steam engine or something like that. Behind me the access to the toilets there will be one accessible changing space toilet so that has all the hoists and everything required to deal with severely disabled people with dignity and then ground floor set of public toilets. As part of the design process, we conducted an online survey. And one of the questions we asked is what sort of toilets would people like? Gender neutral or uh, traditional male and female toilets? And the answer came back 50-50, generally depending on age. So what we've done is sat firmly on the fence. All our public toilets will have a cubicle which has a WC, a sink and a hand dryer and they will have two areas, one on the ground floor and one on a new mezzanine floor that we're putting in above here to link the two first floor spaces in the building. There's another reason for doing that, which is fire regulations. You need to have exits from any first floor area and that will link the two via a bridge which comes across here so visitors will be able to look down on the steam engine plinth. And this part of the building is again an example of how the building has been modified over time. These walls are not original, so this space also would have been open right down to the gable wall. But it was used as stables, as part of the animal farm, the petting zoo. And up here you've got the name Bess, which is one of the horses that uh, local people still remember, um, used to be in the animal farm and petting zoo. So what we're proposing to do with this is to renovate what's here and turn it into four studios. The first of these studios will be what we call the Flax Studio. This will be part of the interpretation plan, but it also where the Flax group that we're already setting up as part of the activity programme will be based with their tools. This will tell you the story all about Flax, what it is, how it's processed, and actually accommodate the people who are doing that processing. The next three studios will be available to be leased by local arts and crafts people. They will have a glass door out to the courtyard so they'll be able to access the building themselves 24-7 when the inspiration takes them. But it'll also have a glass door leading into the cafe so that guests in the cafe can see what's going on in the studios and if artists are amenable they can come in and watch what's going on. We're now in one of the other two first floor areas in the building and we're directly above where we were a minute ago talking about the arts and crafts studios. So this first floor area is going to be part of our backpackers hostel. Why put a backpackers hostel in here? Well we're about 300 meters off the Fife coastal path and Fife Coast and Countryside Trust say that now every year 
50,000 people go from one end of the coastal path to the other, staying somewhere en route. And there are no suitable low-cost facilities in the Leven area for people to stay. So our aim here is to attract people off the coastal path to stay, and some of them already are on our campsite, attract more of them in here to the hostel. So the hostel itself will have 10 rooms, all of them en suite, and they will have a total of 26 beds over the two floors. The other key thing in this part of the building is the bracket, like the ones I pointed out earlier on, which is part of the transmission system for power throughout the building. And I talked when we were at the steam engine plinth about the bridge that'll connect the two first floor areas. That'll come in through the wall behind where that toilet is to allow hostel guests to access this area. We'll be going into the West Wing, as we call it, in a minute, but that will have a separate entrance for backpackers coming into the hostel, but also campsite guests, reception and an office. It'll have a self-catering kitchen and dining area and a sitting area, and then guests will go out into the courtyard to access the five ground floor rooms. So the door directly behind me in the gable end will be the main entrance, which we looked at from the other side inside the building. And in front of me, we will be building a new entrance from the car park towards the main building, alongside redeveloping the car park to include a total of 58 marked parking spaces. That'll include five disabled parking spaces and two electric vehicle charging points. And the path leading out of the car park will be paved and it'll have benches and interpretation panels on it, leading people neatly towards the main entrance to the flax mill. The total cost of the project before reclaiming VAT is nearly £10 million and people often ask why is it so expensive? Well one of the reasons is the state of the brickwork. You can see from this panel here that a lot of the bricks are rotting away. The reason for that is because when the building was built they used cement mortar. Traditionally you would have used lime mortar and when the brick gets wet it allows that moisture to leach out through the, the lime mortar. If you use cement mortar the moisture is retained within the brick and what happens in freezing weather is that moisture then freezes and it blows the front of the brick off. So throughout the building we have to repoint the whole building with lime mortar and we have to replace, turn around or renovate a lot of the brickwork which is why it's such an expensive project. So this part of the building was where the final stage of the process was carried out, scutching. And again this part of the building was completely open from one gable end to the other but it demonstrates how the building has been altered over time to suit how the Russell family wanted to use it. So for example, we talked earlier on about the laundry. We've got a couple of sinks here remaining from the laundry and also the estate offices. So behind me, you can see the estate office cabinets that were built to contain all the documentation. And rather than just tear those up and throw them out, we're gonna reuse those as display cabinets in the reception and shop but also cupboards within the hostel rooms because this part of the building is going to be where the five ground floor hostel rooms will be. This part of the building some of you may remember as the squash court. We're at the far end of the west wing and this area of the building behind me is going to be the plant room for the whole building which contains the pump for the ground source heat pump with the boreholes in the courtyard outside, a total of 12 we anticipate. And the rest of this space is going to be part of the hostel, one of the hostel rooms. So when is all this happening? Well, the project is now in its delivery phase, having secured £8,239,188 of funding from a variety of sources. The largest single funder, the National Lottery Heritage Fund, is putting in nearly £3.5 million. Fife Council, £2 million. The Scottish Government, through the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, £1.5 million. Historic Environment Scotland, £500,000. And the Levermouth Reconnected Programme, £300,000. And then there are a number of smaller funds and trusts that are contributing, as well as the local community who've raised over £64,000 through a crowdfunding initiative. The actual cost is closer to £10 million, but because of the way that we structured the project, we're able to reclaim the majority of the VAT on the capital cost of the renovation project, which comes to about £1.4 million. So that brings us back down to just over £8 million. The development phase finished in August 2021, and we got approval from the National Lottery to proceed to the delivery phase in January. And we are now in the process of putting together the detailed tender documents and the first stage of that tender, which is a questionnaire inviting construction companies 
to express their interest in the project is already out for consultation. We'll then be going out to the second stage, the detailed tender process, once we've shortlisted a maximum of six contractors. And that will then conclude in March next year with construction activity starting on site in April 2023. It's now a 30-month construction project, so that takes us to September 2025, and the building will then open after we've recruited and trained all of the staff that we need at Easter 2026.